So good afternoon, everyone, and many thanks for joining this webinar today. Uh, my name is Efi Saltidu, and I will be the host of today's webinar focusing on teaching in natural and cultural places. In this webinar, we will try to understand what teaching and learning outside actually is, uh, get a better understanding of the practicalities as well as the pedagogical considerations that come with it by focusing on teaching that takes place in nature and in cultural places like a museum. Uh, we will also have the opportunity to discuss about recent research concerning the students' outcomes. And uh, the speaker of today will share with us the relevant experience of the Nordic countries and will present evidence from research and practice. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce Karen Barford, who is a senior lecturer and the research uh, leader in outdoor studies at the uh, VIA University College of Denmark at the Department of Teacher Education. Uh, during the presentation, of course, you will, you will have the opportunity to interact with us via the chat, so please feel free to share your questions and comments, and we will make sure to address them by the end of the live event. Uh, Karen, many thanks for being here with us. The stage is yours. Thank you. And welcome, everybody. I'm so impressed of so many people joining this webinar from so many different Turkey. It really makes me feel part of a com community. So thank you. I will now share my presentation with you. And then I will switch to this um, figure so you can see me sometimes. So I hope you will understand my English. As you can hear, I'm not a native speaker, but I will try to express me in a way that it's possible for everybody to understand. Yeah, so now I share my presentation. And we have become good in this during the COVID. So, uh, the as you can see in the left corner, I'm from Via University College, and that is teacher training. And we are now working in the school education gateway in this platform for school education. My name is Kant Barfel and I'm PhD in outdoor studies. I'm also a research leader in the program of outdoor studies. So we have a lot of research going on and I try to lead it. I try to um, take care of uh, the researchers, the quality of the research that is done in teacher and kindergarten um, area in outdoors. Sorry, Karen, to interrupt. Uh, the way we see the presentation is uh, in, in a different mode. We see also the notes and the next slide. Maybe you need. We don't see it in full screen. Is this better? Yes, now excellent. Thank you. Good. And that's me and my kayak. <laughs> we went here. And then I teach biology uh, and physical education and we have um, national networks concerning working outdoors. So you can see in the last line it says head of the board of the national Ude school network. And I will come back to the Ude school in Danish. Now this is a Danish lesson also. Ude means outdoor and school means school. So it's outdoor school. Yeah. This is what you were promised. And I will try to work with this. I will try to see if we can get around because it's a lot in uh, about 45 minutes. But uh, I will start talking about what do we mean with outdoor outside the classroom? And then I will draw on the experience from the Nordic countries. You know, in Scandinavia, we have a strong tradition of teaching and working outdoors with the pupils. And I do hope that you will um, write your comments and if you have any remarks or discussions in the chat and then we will take a look at it afterwards. So we can see this um, place based, uh, this outdoor as an umbrella and under this umbrella as Knapp he wrote it in 2013, there are um, Maybe I should move this one. Can I do this? Whoa. 
then there are many different ways and understandings of working outside the classroom. In the right corner, you can see it's the outdoor adventure, outdoor activities, outdoor education part with the kayaks, with rope skipping. Then we have more place-based uh, teaching where, you, where the place means a lot. It's uh, very common in history. We have visits at museum. We have community projects, experiential education, nature, kindergarten, forest schools, and so on and so on. So when we, when we work in this field, it's important for us to say, what is it actually we're talking about? Oh, and now I can't change my. Yeah, so when we say we work outdoors or outside, what is it? Is it outside like under the blue sky or the gray sky? That this could be when we work on school grounds with the pupils in parks and in nature. But maybe outdoor or outside teaching also is outside the school grounds, but could be inside. As if we go inside a museum. So when we leave the school, we it doesn't mean that we need to be under the blue sky. Maybe we will go into a church, to a, an art museum or visiting people. Some people also say, well, if it's outside, then it could be outside the curriculum, like extracurricular, that it could concerning not the place, but also the content. Or is it just a pedagogical way where we work outside the teacher center pedagogy? So it's not the teacher in the center, but the activities and the learning process of the pupils, as you can see on the picture. So today, when we work with this field, it's outside the school grounds, but it can also be inside in museums. So it both when we are outside under the blue sky and some of the research concerns school grounds, parks and nature, but it also inside like in museum. It's not outside the curriculum. This webinar concerns what's inside the curriculum. What should the pupils learn in school? And then it has also something to do with the pedagogy. Are you happy? Okay. Yes, everything is <laughs> <Okay>. good, Karen. <laughs> you can understand me or hear me. Oh, please write. Yes, so, yes, uh, we hear yeah. you perfectly. That's great. I will continue my presentation and if you um, you can also uh, raise your hands or anything if you start to get bored, then I will speed up. I'll share the presentation again and see if it's in a good way. Yeah, it's still like this. Good. So Simon Beams, Peter Higgins and Robin Nichol from the University of Edinburgh have been working about where do we go when we go outdoors? And they say, well, we can go very close to the school on the school grounds. We can go into the local neighborhood and we can go on day excursions or in residential expeditions overnight stay. And this webinar concerns when we are at the school grounds or in the local neighborhood, maybe on day excursions. So this is not cons uh, what we're talking about today. is not like week long trips in the desert with rucksack and uh, less food and so on. This is how do we teach when we take the pupils out during everyday school day? And for this, we use the a pedagogical model designed by Arne Nikolaisen Joel in 2010 that we have translated in this way. So if you start in the upper left corner, it says classrooms, activities, paper and paper and computer based versions of the world. And then there is a doubled arrow between what we work with indoors and what we work with outdoors. Because when we teach outdoors, it's nothing extra. It's just another way of teaching exactly the same curricular elements.
but it has implication on forms of knowledge. So we use with the pupils, we work with the pupils' bodies, their senses, their activities in another way as we do indoors. But there's a double arrow. So what we learn outdoors when we teach outdoors, what the pupil learns, they can use indoors and vice versa. What they work with indoors, they can use outdoors. And here we can either use the school surroundings as a learning area, arena, that is a place to learn. But it can also be a source of knowledge, things that we learn about. Let's have an example. If you uh, in biology learn something about whales, you know, the very big, very, very big fish like animals in the sea. You can go outside in the, the school and you can paint them in full size on the ground. Here you use the place as a learning arena. It's a, just a place where there's a lot of space, but you can also go somewhere where they have a skeleton from a whale and then you can use the school surroundings as a source of knowledge because you need to go to the place where skeleton are. Yeah, so when you go outdoors, you can see uh, in down, it says then you will cooperate with the local society. Maybe you will go to the church or to the mosque or wherever and talk to the imam or the priest or the local uh, um, farmer or anybody. Yeah, and then there is an arrow um, pointing towards the left corner saying, well, but when you choose to teach outdoors, then it will have consequences for your pedagogy. So you will use more practical inquiry based and problem solving approaches to your teaching because it makes no sense to make the take the pupils outdoors and then just make them sit and talk to them. You can do that indoors because you have the blackboard or the computers and so on. But outdoors, the pupils need to be practical. They need to work with these problem solving approaches. They need to work with in creative, creating and playful approaches. And when the pupils work like this, when you plan your teaching like this, it will have implication for the learning theories. How do the pupils learn? They will learn by using their body and their senses. They will learn by communicating, talking to each other, collaborating. And when they work like this, they will form the, a holistic human, both their head, what they know, their hand and their heart, what they mean. I have done research with teachers that worked a lot outdoors and I asked them, uh, try to formulate, try to tell me why do you work outdoors? And they said, so they said it's because we want to form a holistic human. And to form this human being, to form them um, pupils with their minds on, their hands on, their heart on, then we need to work with their body and senses. We need them to learn by collaborating, by talking together, by trying to solve problems together. And if they need to do this, they will learn by their body and their senses, and then we need to take them outdoors. So actually, the teachers, they didn't start by taking the pupils outdoors because outdoors is good. They started, the teachers that I made my research upon, Danish teachers, they say, we want to form a holistic a child, a child with head, heart and hands, and then being outdoors is the best way to do it. So it's like the other way around for the teachers. So this is a pedagogical model that you can use when you have to um, express why you're going out. Because we don't go out just to go out. We go out because we have aims and want the pupils to develop in a certain direction. Here is from a recent study 
where it says according to, I don't know if you can see my arrow here, but I point with it. According to the respondents, museum based learning can affect both student and teacher creativity, especially in the aspects of insight and inspiration that generate new ideas and add the variety of solutions that students can come up with when solving a problem. So this is a study upon um, museum based learning and it says more or less the same as the pedagogical model. Now I have to click here. No. Yeah. But it's not only about the place where you go. This picture is from the net and from future learn. Um, here you see a museum pedagogue talking to the children. The children stays uh, passively here and listen. So. Well, if you want to um, affect creativity, insight, inspiration, new ideas, you also have to take into account uh, the approach that you have at the museum or outdoors in nature or in anywhere outside the classroom. Uh, John Quay wrote in this journal of outdoor and environmental education that he argue that the distinct this is a difficult word for me distinctiveness of outdoor education lies in neither a body of knowledge in the content nor skills or practices process but in a deeper level of educational understanding which emphasizes ways of being so when we go outdoors, it's not only about the content or what you can do, but what it makes us discuss what should education do? Why do we educate the pupils? We don't educate them just so they can a lot of have a lot of knowledge upon ancient times. No, we need them to have this educational understanding. Why are we here as human and what should we do? I know this is very philosophical, but this is also a webinar. We really need to um, work on the high lines too. So here are two different approaches to learning in nature. Here on the left, you see one where we copy the same approach as we have indoor. So we have tables. The pupils must sit in the certain direction and they look at the blackboard. So actually the only thing that they will uh, do here is they will learn the same maybe and then they will freeze and think and maybe they get wet if it rains. To the right you see an approach where the pupils are in a sensory, sensory and bodily um, interaction with nature. They are also together as a group. So this is another approach so if we go into nature i will argue that we need to use the possibilities and the specialities the special things and approaches that we can use when we are outdoors instead of just copying the things that we do when we are indoors so it's not only about the place it's also what approach do we have to uh, teaching outdoors and here I will recommend if you, I don't know how good your German is, but this is a German uh, film of Lernen im Leben, how to learn in, in life. Draußenschule, that's German and means uh, learning outside. And you can see in this, this is just a picture of the video, how the pupils, they actually work with their books, but they are also uh, concentrating, they are experiencing, they are trying to get new knowledge by being at, at this museum. Maybe I should move this one. Um, 
an Israeli group of researchers, Bamberger and Tal, uh, they made the study of learning in a personal context, levels of choice in a free choice learning environment in science and natural history museums. So this is about museum le learning. And they said, well, the pupils, um, no, I say something else. The teacher can have different approaches to teaching in a museum. That the pupils can be given different choice constituents. Constituents. That's a difficult word too. So, um, who choose which topic you work with? Who choose where to go? The space. Who choose the objects that the pupils have to work with? How much time do they have? Who can they work with? Is it that they can go and ask the teacher? Is it possible that the museum, the people at the museum, they can make interaction with them, choose to, that the pupils can choose to make interaction with them? Can they choose to make interaction with other pupils? And in which order do they have to work with a task? And then Bamberger and Tal, they worked with this study where they said, okay, if there are no choices for the pupils, if they can't choose anything about topic, space, object, time, interaction or order, then they just have to follow the instructions given by the teacher. Then the learning outcome will be lower than if they are giving at least some choices. Then there are different Levels of limited choice, maybe the pupils can choose how long time they work with this thing, the, with the tasks or in which order. And then there is the free choice visit. I don't know if you have ever been with pupils at the museum with no limits, no topic. They can go everywhere they want. They can look at every object. Uh, they just have to finish to lunch. They can uh, choose to interact with each other and there's no order. And this is the laissez-faire way of making a museum visit, which is actually also not a very good idea if you want them to learn anything. So Bamberger and Tal concluded in this, in this study where they had, I don't remember how many, but a lot of different classes at the museum. They said, OK, if there are a certain level of choice for the pupils, then the learning outcome will be largest. So you don't need to make it very, very, very strict and instructional. You don't need to make it totally laissez-faire and free, but you need to give them at least some degrees of choice, something they can choose to make this visit a learning experience for the pupils. Are there any um, comments for this? No, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll it's good with a little break, huh? Yeah. It's not always like this. In this uh, recent research uh, on undergrade graduates motivation following a zoo experience, um, this um, Research group Heim and Holt took the students to a zoo and they said, while others have reported that structured assessment and chaperones may limit the learning opportunities, that's the no choice visit, yeah? While others have reported that structured assessment and chaperones may limit the learning opportunities and interest of students visiting informal learning settings, our students participants in the more structured group benefited in multiple aspects of motivation just as much as students in the free choice learning group. So it's not always like this. These um, authors conclude that it's because being in a zoo, it's so motivating. It's with all these animals and all these exciting tasks, but at least uh, also we, me as researcher, I can't always say that it's always so that they need these free choices because there are also researchers saying, well, it's not always like this, but at least 
mostly it's like this. So how do we work with these three choices? Because then we have indeterminate situations because we will have situations where we, where me, where you as teachers don't know exactly what is going on. But as Bista says, the, the pedagogical researchers from the Netherlands, he says, of and pedagogical philosopher, uh, Gerd Bista, he says, if you always know what is the result of education, you can lose the aim of education because the aim is not to make small copies of us, of me at least not, and small copies of people who only know the same as you know. So we will need some uncertainty in the learning process. And then we will need indeterminate situations. And Simon Beams and Mike Brown have been have written, written this book, Adventurous Learning, a, ped get a pedagogy for changing world, because the pupils that we teach now, they need to be in a changing world. So one, um, one approach for us as teachers are that multiple courses of action should be available for students to pursue, that there's not one right answer to the task that we will ask them. There are open situations, there are some choices of importance for them to, to do during the teaching les the lessons. Ooh. Now we will turn to something else. Are you ready for this? Because uh, what are the qualities of being outdoors? To the left, you can see uh, one of my courses in outdoor education where we are cooking outdoors. There's a lot of sensory um, experiences. We are cooking apples, pancakes. Up in the corner, you can see some mushrooms that we have been picked. And to the right is the one of our local museums. This museum is about ships, wrecks, you know, ships that, um, what do you call it, when they, they can't sail anymore and then uh, they go down on the bottom of the sea. And these are very old sailing ships and you can see them in here. And then the sea is very close. So here you will see the some sensory qualities and you will see some qualities where what's in the museum is connected to what is just outside the museum. So it's not when I take my students here, they they don't just have to be inside the museum. They also have to experience the neighborhood of the museum because that's also uh, one of the qualities. Peter Bjarne Jansen, his name is down here. He made this model of uh, qualities in outdoor teaching or outdoor education. And he said, OK, there will be some sensory and exploring qualities. The pupils will use their senses, but they will also explore uh, um, other things in the world. They will move their bodies. There are some physical and motor qualities. They are not just sitting. They have to walk around, maybe they have to lift something, maybe they have to climb on the things. There are also very often some manual and productive qualities. If you're going to if you're going to make your own food, if you're going to make the fire, if you're going to run down here and um, write a poem concerning the wild water, whatever, then you have to produce something. You have to work with your hands, which is manual. And then there are often very many social and verbal qualities. Of course, if the approach is that the teacher stands in the middle, out in nature and talk to the pupils. You will not have so many social and verbal qualities. But if you take the pedagogical model and say, well, the pupils have to work inquiry based, they have to talk together, they have to work in groups, then there will be social and verbal qualities. And these are all connected together when you're outdoor. 
So is it really so that one cure just going outdoors fits all? That outdoor teaching will improve your teaching by enhancing physical activity, build motivation, give you better knowledge, more social awareness, more less bullying. No, because this is in Danish, because it's a very bad word. This uh, book is about very bad education. The education, your teaching will not become good just because you go outdoors. Your teaching will be good because you're a good teacher and because you use the possibilities that you will have outdoors. You will use all the experiences. You will use the, the approaches that are different when you are outdoors. So this, say, this booklet said, also poor teaching is not a common pedagogical concept. It is a currently important concept as it sharpens the awareness of what it takes to achieve good teaching. Also, outdoor teaching needs development and quality. So now it's your turn, please, here in the sunken ships, yeah, the, here in the chat to write what is really bad education? What should you avoid as teachers when you go outdoors? So please, don't hesitate to write something. I'll start. Yeah. Anybody else who knows what should we avoid when we are outdoors? Avoid lecturing. Yeah. Uh, we are not finished yet. This type, there have to be a sort of structure. Yeah, no, yeah, that's true. This type of system is passion. Yeah. I see also comments, Karen, about the need for planning to have learning activities and not just have this free time that you mentioned also. Yeah, yeah, I will. I will come back to something about planning. Yeah, avoid going along with a large group of kids. Yeah. Yeah. Make boundaries. Yeah. So there's something about safety. To avoid screaming. Yeah, that's true. Scaffolding all students. Yeah. Yeah. It's so nice to, to see all your comments. And you know, good teaching outdoors is maybe not very much different from good teaching indoors because it's some of the experience and the objectives and planning and misbehavior, all these things are also issues that we work with when we uh, work outdoors. So please, uh, here is a picture of me teaching outdoors. And what can you see what I'm doing wrong here? This is me uh, standing there. So please write in the chat, what am I doing wrong on this picture? I think it's okay because it's me who's wrong. Yeah, I'm lecturing. I'm not at the same level. <laughs> I'm not interacting. Yeah, teacher center teaching. Yeah, that's true. Standing, student sitting. Yeah. I'm also saying, uh, yeah, you have them against the sun. Yeah, that's true. I have them against the sun. You take like class, yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm so happy to say it's an old picture. You can see they are sitting still, they are freezing. It's in Denmark, it's always cold in Denmark. And uh, there's a person uh, in the back, she's even try. she started to do something else with her back to me. There's somebody sitting here with an ax and I tell you, this is not a picture taken because of uh, it's not instructed. This is just a real picture. I'm so ashamed. 
but uh, good that you can see what you shouldn't do. So now it's time for a two minute break. Please don't check your emails, but stretch your body and mind. And if you want to, because I'm a PE teacher, I will make a short program for you. So you can stand up. Yeah, and you can move your shoulders. And you can stretch up to sun. One arm, another arm, one arm, another arm. You can take your arms out wide because it will take this away. Come up here, open, open, and in your knees and up, and knees and up, and on knee. Yeah, and then jump side to side. Yeah. I'm ready again. <laughs> yeah. And then we will take our shoulders up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And our heads. OK, let's take the few slides left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So this is my husband fishing, actually. So if we go to Udeskole, then the museum pedagogue Heinz said that children need time, usually more than one visit, to become orientated to a museum. So when we work with Udeskole, we work regularly out by, outside, and that can be one or a half day per week. That's a lot. It's a Scandinavian or Nordic term. In Germany, they call it Draußenschule, as I showed you on the film. And we go in nature, to cultural places, and in society. So it's curriculum-based teaching in elementary school, and we have elementary school from 6 to 16, where we are taking advantage of environments outside the school buildings, including school grounds, on a regular basis. And here you can see different examples. We have focus on place and pedagogy, and we work with these collaborative, action-centered, experiential, inquiry-based and thematic learning processes. We had a great study where we had 18 classes working outdoors and the parallel classes, you know, the same class, but with another teacher working indoors. And we could see that uh, oh, numbers in English, 37% uh, of the time they were in nature and 28% uh, of the time they were uh, in cultural places. And, but they also used a lot of time in the school area. So going outdoors can be many places. In this study we showed, and I need to explain this figure. This is um, from self-determination theory, different kind of motivation going to school. So it's not time on the x-axis, it's different motivations. And the red line is the control classes, those who worked indoors. So, but you can also see they're really spreading the numbers. But those who are working indoors compared to when we started the teaching, which is at zero, then all the ways, all four ways of motivation were lowered. So these students, they get more and more bored going to school in all kinds of motivation. But the pupils that were outdoors, they did not lose the motivation being in school. You know, it's a main problem that during the year, the students lose their motivation. But these students that were outdoors, they were measured in the beginning of the year and when the year were finished, and they did not lose their motivation. While those that were indoors, they lost their motivation, their intrinsic motivation, 
there are identified and introjected motivations and the external motivation. That was one result from the teach out project. Yeah, it's the same. I just the other result that we had were that depending on where the education outside the classroom took place, they were moving their bodies more or less. The yellow ones are the sedentary behavior. They were sitting still. Less time when they were in nature than when they were in, at the museums. They had more light physical activity when they were in the green areas. You can see they have more. And they had a more moderate to vigorous physical activity when they were in the green areas. So it seems if we only look at how much physical activity these students are doing, then nature is the best place to be. OK, to teach them compared to school grounds, it's not a big difference, but uh, still they are moving more light physical activity than they are doing when they are having physical education in school, which is a bit strange, but they are. So oh, here is a picture of pupils running. I have taken them outdoors and you can see this is totally panic for me as a teacher because some students are running into the forest with no goals. Some are running back, but very close to the sea. One is freezing. They doesn't seem to have any aims. There's no structure and no control. So when we're talking about bad um, outdoor education, this will um, show us some of the barriers that we will have as teachers. Fantic Vesalius made the study of barriers to outdoor teaching, and they said one barrier is there's a lack of a formal status of outdoor learning in teacher educational practice. So when I go out with my students, my colleagues say, oh, you're going outdoors and having a bonfire again or something like that. It's, it has no formal status. Many teachers have no confidence in their own outdoor teaching expertise. And many teachers said it's difficult to get started. So these are the three main barriers. Many teachers say we have lack of time. We have lack of communal structure. They are also saying we fear losing control and managing children's behavior. Some of you also wrote this in the chat. And uh, yeah. If we look at the lack of confidence in your own teaching, outdoor teaching expertise, because I cannot work with you and say, well, you need to make conscious decision to devote time to establish outdoor learning because that should be your leader. But I can say, well, some of the things you can do is that you can familiarize with outdoor learning. You can start, take one hour out or half an hour. And then it's really important to work with the organization and rules, with the habits, with the pupils' habits, with your habits, so the pupils know what are we going to do? What is the aim of going out? That you have worked with the papers they need to bring out. That you have told them, when do we have lunch break? That you have worked with, what are we going to learn? And these are some of the barriers you can work with. So you lose your lack of confidence. So you get confidence in your own outdoor teaching expertise. One of the things you can work with, and this is this film again, Draußen schön lernen in Leben, where they said you need to leave responsibilities to the pupils. They need to know where to meet. They need to know how to behave. And in this film, uh, the pupils ask each other. So one pupil say to the other, did you bring your rain clothes? Did you bring your outdoor book? And then they say, did you bring your brain? 
And I really love this. Hast du deine Gehirn dabei? Did you bring your brain? So maybe we should conclude that good education outdoors is not very much different from good education indoors. You still need introductions, you still need aims, you still need activities and feedback to the pupils. The pupils still need experiences and time for reflections. This is an outdoor reflection book that uh, I always, all my students get this book. So, and you can see it's hardback, so they can uh, write in it and we always take pictures. So we need to have time for reflection upon what the activities and we need to have strong relations between teacher and pupils. So ooh, now it's time for questions. Yeah, I need to go up and see. Many thanks, Karen. Well, I see that uh, in the comments, I see that participants were very interested in everything that you described and explained. So thank you very much for that. I saw a comment popping up from uh, Isabel, uh, well, highlighting actually the number of students per per class or per school. Uh, what's what's your advice here uh, related to organizing uh, learning outside the classroom? Um, if you have a big number of students, for instance, in your class? Yeah, I think there are very many um, national differences here because in Denmark we have only up to 28 pupils in a class. And if you, it also depends on where you go, because if you go in the nearby environment, if you go just um, down in the schoolyard or at the sports place, if you as an example, have language at, at the sports field. Maybe you can be just by yourself because you're so close to the toilets and you're so close to um, to the office where the people at the at the school works. If you have to go further, you always have to need to the need to be at least two. Either you have some parent helpers. Maybe you have a museum pedagogy that is there as an adult too. Maybe you have um, a, a help. You have, I don't know if you have it, but we usually have some um, student helpers or something go to go to class, pe class pedagogues. So there are many different solutions to this, but you should never go alone and you should always have a mobile phone that the pupils are instructed to use too because if something happened to you somebody else has to call for help so there needs to be a number they can dial to the school and so on so um i would actually i would say that you could just be the same amount of adults as as you are indoors if you're just in the very close neighborhood and if you have worked with the routines when I do like this, you all go to the wall. Or when I wave, I once was in Latvia and there was a teacher, she just raised her hand and then all the pupils came. I don't know how she made that, but really, yeah. Can you share how you plan an activity outdoor, how you start the planning? Do you have a checklist? Do you work alone? Um, when I start my planning, I always think of what is the topic? What is it that we are working with just now? And what outdoor activity can enhance the learning process? So if we work with verbs, you know, uh, and nouns and different words, tree, <laughs> leave, go out and find these things. Or uh, if we work with I can run, I can hop, we go out and do this. If this is what they need to learn, if they if they need to learn mathematics and they work with numbers, then I say, well, you may, can you find anything with a symbol of five and it can be leaves and so on. So uh, I think what should they learn and how can this going outdoors make them learn it better? And then, um, 
I either make the activity myself or I find them on the net or I find something on the internet that I make a bit different. Sometimes if, if you are a bit unsure, you can take some of the tasks that you usually do indoor, you know, maybe maybe you have um, a task where there's a lot of words and a lot of things they need to find here and they need to make lines. Then you can copy them, take them outdoors and make the pupils run from one thing to another. So you can also start by taking some of the tasks that you do indoor and make them bigger. Is a field study necessary before the action will? What is a field study? I suppose that uh, Eva means uh, that uh, if the teacher needs to visit the place before yeah. just to check yeah. what uh, the, also yeah. the safety issues, the possibility is offered yeah. by the space itself. You always need to go there first. But when you have been there, you don't need to go there again. So, uh, um, yeah. Um. And also I see a question from uh, Anes. If there is, if you have an interesting uh, website or resource or repository in general of ideas related to uh, teaching outside the classroom, uh, do you have a resource yeah. to share? Uh, just to no mention also here that uh, Karen has included in the presentation some links and some uh, uh, resources for further reading. So you will receive the PowerPoint. Um, we will share the PowerPoint online as as we promised. And also, if you need to the dive a bit deeper on the topic and uh, hear more from Karen, if you want to uh, learn more about the practicalities of organizing learning outside the classroom. Uh, we warmly invite you to join the MOOC, uh, which started last uh, Monday, the Teaching Outside the Classroom MOOC. I shared the link on the chat and there you will find also videos with Karen sharing more practical ideas and suggestions about uh, what you're asking about organizing teaching outside the classroom. So make sure you join it and uh, benefit from this free online uh, professional development opportunity. Maybe I should show some of the tasks that I I'll give. I didn't claim this, so I have to get them over here. Mm -hmm. If it's OK, will you? Yes, I see some questions uh, in the meantime. Are parents sometimes allowed to participate in outdoor education activities? Yes, I think uh, as Karen mentioned, it's also recommended to involve parents yeah. in some outdoor activities and uh, make them be your help helpers in these outside learning activities. But of course, guidance is needed. Yeah, this is uh, we were working with Wales and and uh, with math and uh, we were working with scale. You know, how big is a whale actually and what is the mathematics behind? And then we went to the beach and they had to make them in real size. So they had to measure. They have to work together, the pupils and so on. This is a. Uh, this is a game we made with small wood glasses with small insects that they have to run as fast as possible. This was actually in physical education because the the small animals has to come first. We we really work with a lot of of different thing and they always have this booklet where they write in and and have the ideas written. Yeah. So um one I more hope question Related to the weather, Karen, is it uh, um, is outside learning considered only for during uh, the well autumn or uh, springtime uh, because of weather restrictions, or is it uh, something that we can do also in winter? What's your advice here? That depends on which country you come from. Before, but uh, um, usually I say when we work in Denmark. And you know, it's a northern hemisphere. It's really, really bad weather sometime. We um the pupils are used to have good clothing on. So what I work with is that they need to I need to plan activities where they are physically active. Like when we start the day, we like go fast for a walk for a quarter of an hour. So so they will be warm. Then the activities is not uh, things where they have to ride or sit uh, with flowers or something. It's more like running or 
moving a stone or something. And and then I have some um, games to. I I have um, a lot of ideas with small games that I can use. So, uh, like here we have the crows, a bird. And here we have another kind of birds, the owls, very clever ones. So oh, there's a lot of kids here. There's a lot of kids here and I'm in the middle. And then I say something, you know, depending on what we're working with. Um, this is a book. And if it's right, then the owls, woo -woo -woo, they have to run and catch the crows. And if it's wrong, this is a bird. It's then the crowds have to get the owls and so on. So I have some running games that I can, yeah, I can use during the day. So clothing, um, that the pupils are moving their body, that you are aware of that they don't stand in the wind. And then we have hats, um, you know, warm hats for everybody that somebody gave us for free. I won't say who, but somebody gave us a lot of hats so you can use them on the kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, one question from uh, Iro from Greece. From what dates you start taking students out? Yeah, you know, we have this strange habit in Denmark that from they are very, very small, they sleep in the cribs outdoors. So we have uh, we are world champions in outdoor kindergartens. Kids are outside in Denmark. And when they come to school, they get more or less indoors. So it it's more that the oldest one, they're sitting there with their computers all day. It's um, younger kids are outside and they are outside three or four hours per day in kindergartens in Denmark. Yeah. So I see people also are very interested in activities that you can plan outside. So I think that this webinar Karen provides a great uh, inspiration for people to start searching more about it. So I would very kindly redirect you to the um, uh, to the MOOC that I mentioned earlier, because there you will find yeah great ideas shared and also ideas shared among teachers who practice outside learning already. So uh, we 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 learn from each other, we inspire each other. There are many great practices taking place in schools in across uh, Europe. So we, we really want to share them and uh, learn from each other. So please make sure that you can uh, follow and join this opportunity as well. Um, if there are not any other questions, which I don't see now in the chat, um, I would like to yeah, thank you, Karen, very much for this uh, very interesting presentation. If you have, of course, anything else to say, any last words, please, uh, please do. Uh, otherwise, I think we are perfectly on time on <laughs> closing this webinar. It's all always a good idea to um, close two minutes before time. <laughs> I, I'll uh, I'll just say that uh, my last slide was that now you all had to reflect a bit what was new to me, what did I learn, what will I use during the next few months in my own practice. So I hope for all the kids in Europe that it's that you have a lot of good ideas. I know you're good teachers because you joined in for learning something more. But still, we can all improve our practice. And uh, so thank you for sharing your questions. Thank you for joining in. And let's get outside with the kids. Excellent. Thank you, Karen. Thank you all for joining. Have a lovely evening and uh, keep up the great job.